Oh, dude, it did going to work. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello, Hello everyone. There we go. There we go. Let's try it. I'm again. sorry. Uh, this is Sports Nerds. I am Dr. Samuel J. and... Uh, Dr. Brian Schrader. Hi. And uh, this is our first attempt to uh, to stream some video along with our audio. So, you know, we want to give fans... Give them what they want. Give them what they want, which includes um, some blow-up mattresses, correct? Yeah, I put a, I put a comforter on it. You'll see. Okay. All right. I, as you can it, see, it I'm, could be a I'm, I'm in my office here at uh, a Division II school in, uh, in, uh, in Denver, Colorado, so be prepared to see a transient individual or three walking by my window at any given moment with or without pants. It's kind of warm today. So. I'm, I'm in the guest room of my house. How you doing, buddy? I'm good. What's yeah? It? Yeah. Did you have a good weekend watching some basketball? Oh, my gosh. It was great. Yeah, I was, was in the airport last night watching that UNC Kentucky finish, which was just nuts. Like UNC seemed like they had that two or three times, but they never really did. No, it never really did. I it mean, almost, it did eventually, but it was like the end of uh, it was it was like last year's championship game with Villanova and North Carolina. Is it's, it sad? Can I will I lose my sports nerd card if I say that I turned that game off? No, no, that's okay. There's no, I'm not gonna fault you with that. Or, you know what? Maybe I didn't turn it off. Maybe I, would, I went to sleep. No, I guess that's the same thing. I was just like, eh. What happened? Was it was it over? Did it feel like it was over? Yeah, Villanova hits a ridiculous last-second shot, don't they? Yeah, but, oh, I thought you were meant, like, with 10 minutes left. I, mean, no, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't turn it off because it was over. I turned it off because it was, you know, I'm on East Coast. Well, Eastern time zone. I think we watched the very last bit of it. And, uh, yeah, that was pretty wild, but it's been a great tournament thus far. It's been fantastic. Yeah, no, it's been, um, it's been, I mean, look, a, 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 a three seed and a seven seed in the final four. What, what else can you ask for? That's a good point. I, I well, let's, we'll get into that here in a second. Cause I've got a couple questions for you when it comes to, to seeding, but, uh, our rundown for the show is going to be uh, just a quick update on our March madness pool, which is starting to get a little bit crazy. I think there's a lot of folks that are still, in the hunt, depending on how the Final Four shakes out. Uh, we want to talk about uh, advanced analytics and the impact on Division One college basketball. So that'll be our first main segment. We're going to talk a little bit about LeVar Ball. I think we've, tried, we've been trying to put that off for the last three to four weeks. <laughs> but uh, today we will have that conversation about LeVar Ball and shitty parenting. And then uh, we'll wrap up with just a quick, some quick commentary on Major League Baseball's rule change. Uh, in, in relation to the intentional walk. So let's begin here. Uh, we do have a new logo. If you haven't noticed uh, that new logo, you'll find on our Facebook page. So if you go to Facebook and it's just at sports nerds, that's where we are. Uh, we have officially kind of taken back over the, uh, the sports nerds Twitter feed, which is just at underscore sports nerds. And with this particular episode, we're going to be uh, launching our self on, uh, on onto the YouTube interface. And so, uh, be on the lookout for all of that stuff. We did post um, the video version of last week's podcast. It wasn't really a video. It was just a way to post on Facebook. So if you didn't check that out and you missed last week's episode and you don't particularly down or you don't download the podcast to your uh, to your phone via iTunes or Stitcher, then go ahead and find us on Facebook and, and listen that way. We've this was a big week for positive feedback, I think. I uh, I, heard, I heard from three different people whom I've never talked to before about the podcast uh, that said that they listened to the podcast, including uh, a guy I used to caddy with, uh, who now I think Cody lives in Nashville now. He's uh, attempting to be a country music star, which he may have some success at that. And then uh, Jeff Furwa, who I know Jeff's reached out to us before, but he's the one that sent us the, the stuff on advanced analytics. So he likes to think of himself as a, a P1 day one. Which just means he's top, one of the top listeners. But and then Shane, right? Your buddy Shane for, uh, offered us some some good feedback. Correct? Yeah, from across the pond. From yeah, he's in England. So again, I think we've got all that we, we've milked um, the friend uh, the friend pool for this. So uh, if you could do us a favor, That's friends, milking. yeah, milking the friend pool. There we go. Uh, if you could do us a favor, friends and family, uh, share the podcast with others. Um, via whatever social media outlets you have. And uh, be sure to just have people search for us on Google, just sports nerds, because uh, we're, we're going to 
try to make our web presence a little bit more um, extensive uh, after this episode. But so today, real quick, Brian, uh, update on our March Madness pool. So going into the final four, uh, Adam Schwarzenegger, who is kind of Spud's been leading from day one. He's got 920 points and Gonzaga winning. Uh, these picks, have we decided who that is? I don't think that's Marcus. That is Marcus. Per- it is? Okay. Yeah, Dr. Perosky. Oh, okay. So Marcus has 820, which he would be in the running should – he's, he's not able to score any more points. Yeah, so, so I think he, he's – So he has, he has less than the number one person. Yes. So he, he, he's, he cannot be higher than number two. And I don't think because of considering the folks who – Considering the folks who are below him, everybody's going to have at least one in the championship game. I would, unless, well, maybe I guess there are ways that Marcus could, you know, stay in that number two spot. Yeah, he could. Uh, stay. Yeah, for sure. Um, Jason Kenny uh, in there at uh, 100, or excuse me, 810 points. He has Gonzaga winning. The state and of Michigan is well represented in this top five. Three, three, three Michiganders. Yes, and then uh, Ben Kilberg. Uh, 800, I think Ben, I don't know if Ben can score any more points. Uh, and then Jill Schrader, Brian's wife, who will take the, the crown if North Carolina wins. And then Liz And Wood. let me tell you, she poured over these picks for a oh, while. Oh, I'm sure. Just, she did just, not, she did not just randomly pick teams to win. No. Well, she, I think she's a student of the game. Yeah. And, okay. Yeah. Liz Wood, my sister-in-law, is kind of the same way. I think she spent an entire morning in which she should have been working. Uh, picking, you know, selecting her picks. So, way to go, sister-in-law. Sis, uh, she comes in at 780, and I think she could score a few more points. A few more. Uh, yeah, I can say. But but here's the – if folks are really interested in this, there are three people that have a chance at actually still winning this. Jared Ellis, which is uh, one of Brian's good buddies, friend of mine as well. Um, I think he's got, he's got, he's got, like, he's got a lot of points he could still score. Uh, my oh, littlest no, brother. I don't think he can win it, though. No, because if Gonzaga wins, then Dick oh, takes it and yeah, that's what it is. So My, he can he can finish in a solid third place, okay. just a few points out, and be uh, disappointed. My littlest brother, who is actually taller than me, John Jay, he has Oregon and Gonzaga in his championship game. Which wow. props to that. Yeah, I know. Now they, I'm guessing he did just guess on this. Unless he was looking for a reason not to work, but eh, could have been. And then Derek Yoder, so Turtle, uh, college buddy of mine, he also has a chance because I believe, man, who does he have winning? I want to say he has North Carolina winning. So maybe that'll be the battle between Jill and, and Turtle um, yeah. if North Carolina were to win it at win. But man, I mean, it's crazy to think that this stuff isn't in the bag already. Is um, it worth pointing out that we call ourselves the sports nerds and you finished? One of your pick, one of your two brackets, is in dead last, mm-hmm. and one mm-hmm. of mine is yeah. fourth to last. Yeah, but if you will notice, I'm now in the top ten. Ass hat, ass hat, Brian. Are you I, you I, I, I'm number ten there. I'm, I'm calling you an ass hat. My once again on this Monday morning, my brain is not fully functioning. It'll get there hopefully by the end of the episode. But I think I come in there at number ten. So I didn't. Yeah, I didn't make it. That's true. Yeah, I'm at ten. Hey, but I'm I'm winning Catherine's uh, work pool. So there's yeah, a lot of people bragging about a different pool that has nothing to do with this. I mean, yeah. I really care Here's a contest idea I was thinking about next year. We get a group of like 10 of us, um, have a pretty decent buy-in and you get to pick like your four brackets across different platforms and you just throw them into this pool. So we do like an old school approach where we have to email each other a PDF of the brackets. Fax, fax machine. Yeah. Carbon, carbon yeah. paper. Okay, these these four instead because that way, right? I've heard this for the last week. Oh, in this other pool, right? I'm perfect. In this other pool, no, right? This is we're gonna we're gonna send each other our top four brackets or top three, and the winner maybe winner take all. But we'll that, we're a year from that. Right now, we're working on fantasy baseball. Like so after the fact, you do that. No, well, you don't I guess answer we your top. Do you answer your top three at the beginning, or like. As, as the tournament progresses, you're like, oh, here's my best three. I'm going to put those in. Ooh. Maybe we should do it after the first round and throw them in there and say, okay, here. These are my best three. I don't know. We'll think about it. We've got a year to think We'll figure about it out. It. Yeah. And by so, having a year to think about it, that means uh, in about a year we'll start thinking about it. Exactly. In the same way that we – months. Yep. The same approach we, uh, we take to preparing for this podcast. Hey, listen. This is not our full-time job. 
No. I think we were prepared today. Yes. Hopefully <laughs> folks recognize that. Which, uh, which leads us to, to our first story. Um, there was a video that Jeff Furwas sent us uh, last week, into last week. And it's an interview from December with Marshall's head coach, uh, Marshall University, West Virginia School, Division One basketball school, with Mark D'Antoni, who is, um, what's his brother's name? Mike. Mike D'Antoni's brother. I think it would be his older brother. So Mike D'Antoni's the head coach of the Houston Rockets, who D'Antoni and the Rockets GM have been really at the front forefront of advanced analytics and basketball. But D'Antoni takes um, his brother, Mike, or sorry, Dan D'Antoni takes Mike's approach to the three-point shot and applies it to college basketball. So in December, at the time of this interview, Marshall was seven and six. They ended up 20 and 15, which is, I don't know. I mean, that's pretty impressive for a team that has very little basketball history. They ended up seventh in points per game, uh, NCAA Division One basketball. Uh, 85.6, fourth in three points attempted. And the reason why D'Antoni takes this approach, and I'm going to pull up the most recent stats, stats I could find. Okay. These are stats from the, from, um, the, from the NBA. So obviously it's not the same for uh, NCAA basketball, but it gives you an idea of, of just why a coach would apply advanced analytics to shot selection. So a shot taken within zero to three feet has a 62.8% chance of going in. But again, the reward for success is just two points. So if you take the percentage of those shots made and you calculate it with the uh, reward for success, you can say that those shots are worth about 1.3 points. Okay, so um, a a shot basically in the paint is worth 1.3 points. Uh, Now a shot, a three-point shot, is worth 1.05 points, okay? Now, those only go in 35% of the time, but it's the idea that you are better off taking shots completely inside, so layups, or you're better off taking three-point shots. Because if you look at the statistics from just your basic, uh, your, your jumpers, right, your two-point jumpers, uh, there is nothing over 0.8, 0.8 points per, per attempt. Oh, wow. So yeah, so so you know, so if you're shooting range or yes, long two point baskets, two point shots, completely worthless, or, or, right? Yeah. You want layups, right? Which is you see the increase of uh, the fast break, or not the increase of the fast break, but teams that attempt to play that high energy basketball. Dayton was a good example. Even I think Wichita State did a really good job of shutting that down in the first round of uh, eliminating the fast fast break points. So. Or the three-point shot. And I think when you look at Marshall's approach to the game and also how Houston, the Rockets play, it's the same idea, right? You want to push the ball as fast as possible. If you can't get the layup, then you take the three-point shot. I mean, the Warriors do that to a T. Yeah. And so, drive, yeah, I mean, drive, drive and kick, drive and kick. Absolutely. So I guess our question for this particular segment is, what happens when um, teams like Duke or Kansas or Kentucky – are able to get skilled players and apply this approach uh, to this to, with skilled players because for now, right, this is March. Marshall is that kind of gimmicky offense that's attempting to to uh, play a type of style that will just uh, not get lucky, but uh, outmaneuver, I suppose, uh, teams that have more talent. But I guess, what, in your opinion, what do you think happens when a team that has the best talent in the nation? plays this type of game Are um, we gonna, I, mean, I, I assume the effect would would be pretty darn similar i mean there's there's a broader kind of strategy question about this i mean um it's not always true but typically if you want to put a bunch of good three-point shooters out there to 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 maximize um the effect of this strategy um that means you're you're going smaller right probably your lineup's going to mm-hmm. be a little bit smaller, so there might yeah. be a trade-off on the defensive end of the ball, right? So, you know, what does this strategy, what effect does this strategy have on your personnel and the style of, of play that you have to play um, on the defensive end? But you're right; like the Warriors have done this already, and they can they can force other teams um, to go small who can come out and try and defend on the perimeter. So it doesn't mean that um, to do this strategy, you go small, other teams stay big, and you can't play defense. 
um, other teams are going to have to make adjustments to play against you as well. And I think that's why, you know, last year and especially two years ago, even three years ago, um, the Warriors were really good at this because teams were not really good at figuring out how to make those um, kind of size adjustments. But, um, you know, the, the, the math, the theory on this makes a ton of sense to me. I mean, and I think, I think the NBA has been um, hip to this idea, not, not, not for an overall strategy of how you should design your offense, but kind of understanding that really long two point shots are not, are not worth it, that there's not, there's not a lot of value um, in the, in those shots. So you're seeing a lot more kind of, um, you know, kicking it to a, to a, a, a three guard or a, you know, a small forward, kind of just hanging out at the baseline or something like that, driving and kicking, maybe maybe more so than, than you did um, in in other offensive schemes, right? Um, I'll say this, though. Like, I, I wonder if you get pushback from, from maybe, I don't know, basketball purists or even a thing, but people who say this isn't how – actually, I know, I know for a fact that, pe- that, that people have said that about the Warriors, right, that, um, you know, shooting a bunch of threes is – it's, it's ugly basketball. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't, it's aesthetically not pleasing. It's not the way the game should be played um, or whatever. Um, but, but I, I think, I think that resistance is probably based on the notion that in certain situations, it, it's okay to take long two point shots. Um, this, this, if you, if you're going to employ this as a strategy for your offense, you're playing the long game. Does that make sense? Yes. This is not yeah. about individual plays. This is about over the course of multiple games, um, a, a season, multiple seasons. If you sort of employ this as your offensive philosophy, you're likely to yield more points. Here's a good example of this. Everyone in the in the past few years, I'm sure, has heard of like the high school football coach um, who never punts and never kicks field goals, right? Yeah. Who says you should play for four downs? Yeah. yeah. Th- this that strategy you could say in an individual instance doesn't work, right? You go for it on fourth down and you don't get it and you give the other team the ball in really good field position. But over the course of a game or a couple of games or a season or a couple of seasons, that strategy is going to benefit you, right? Does that make mm-hmm. sense? So I think that's, that's, no, the way, that's the way that you have to think about these, these, these trends. So a good example of this is last night, um, uh, Kentucky ties, right? T- ties that basketball game with that long three-pointer. Yeah. Um, and then North Carolina wins this, wins the game on a really long two pointer. Yes. Right. What well, was almost a three point shot, right? They went and looked at it to make sure it wasn't, it wasn't a three. This philosophy doesn't say in that moment, you shouldn't take that long shot, right? right. That you should yeah. back up behind the three point line or that he should have driven to the basket. I mean, in that moment, that shot was, I mean, it went in, right. It's hard to say right. that was a bad idea. Um, right. So, so, I mean, I think that's a, a, an instructive way to think about, the way that analytics gets applied. You can't say, oh, it didn't work in that one situation, or here's a situation in which it makes sense to take a long two, therefore the philosophy is a bad one. I think you have to say, will it work over the course of time, right? And I, th- I think the answer is, again, yes, but also adjustment, right? If a defense goes really small as well against you and puts a lot of um, quick defenders who can who can come out to the perimeter and and defend three point shooters well, then the math changes, right? Then those teams probably decrease the 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 likelihood of you making those three three pointers, your your three point shooting percentage, and then changes the math. Um, so maybe that three point attempt is not worth as much relative other shots, right? Along to or or driving to the basket. And that's where a good team then will make a secondary adjustment and say, once we've kind of forced you to go small, then we'll make a quick sub and go big or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you, you brought a really good point, right? Over the span of a seven-game series, even, you would think that the Warriors' approach to, to the game is going to win out uh, statistically. Now, what's interesting is uh, what happens when you can't adjust for that one game, you know, the game seven, which I'm not sure, I'm not going to say that that's what happened last year in the NBA Finals, but... I do think that that has happened during um, during these kind of one game playoffs, of basically of, of the NCAA tournament, right? Uh, and again, a great example is Dayton's inability to adjust to Wichita State slowing the pace of the game down, right? Or I'm trying to think of that Michigan Oregon game because um, you and I had talked a little bit that that approach from Michigan, especially, which was just to throw up a lot of shots uh, in, in certain spurts. That did work 
They and did again, shoot a lot of threes in that game. They did shoot a lot of threes, right? Um, it was kind of making me mad, but yeah. I, I, I guess we're going to see I th- a, a great example of this should Gonzaga end up playing like Oregon. Right, or Gonzaga, even even North Carolina, which Gonzaga's inside game, right? They have just two. They have that one huge mountain of a man. I can't even think what his name is, but he's massive. Um, can right? Can can the can you change the game to? Uh, can you change? I guess the the statistics enough in your favor uh, that you're able to work the ball inside and get those layups, even though they're not necessarily layups and they're more just kind of a paint game um, to counter. North Carolina's talent on the perimeter. I don't know. That'll be quite interesting uh, to see if that happens or even, you know, Oregon, if Oregon wins. Um, I guess I'm just assuming that Gonzaga is going to beat South Carolina. That I think that Cinderella story comes to an end uh, very soon. But I don't know. They keep winning. Um, I don't know. It's just it's just really interesting um, in because what I'm taking from, from your comment is that approach to the college game works to get you into the tournament right it might during a 35 game season um, you might be able to win 24 25 games playing this uh, this type of basketball but you have to be able to adjust when you're dealing with dirt dealing with different teams come you know the NCAA tournament which that's a different uh, I guess it's a different way of winning a title than even the NBA playoffs, where if you take this approach and it's successful over the course of 82 games, you can assume that it's going to be successful in a seven-game series. You're gonna you're gonna you know win four out of seven games. Yeah. So it's totally different. You know, it's totally different. So I guess hmm, I'm, yeah, I'm, no. you're, I mean you're, you're right. I wonder about what that. happens. I guess we would see it right if Marshall. We should follow this story next year. Right. If Marshall's 20 and 15 this year, I would you know once they start getting some shooters in there, and they might have. They might be a lock for the tournament. What happens then, right? What happens when they play that kind of basketball in a tournament? So it'd be interesting yeah, I mean, to see. I mean, I think a good. Sorry, I, I, I keep cutting you off. Uh, Middle t- Middle Tennessee State uh, is a really good example of this approach to basketball in the NCAA tournament. And last year, Middle Tennessee State, uh, I think they were, a, I want to say they were a 15 seed, right, and beat uh, Michigan State because they. They hit a lot of threes. They were hot that, you know, as they say, right? We know that that's, in terms of sports analytics, that's complete bullshit. But they were they had a hot day. And we saw the same thing when they beat Minnesota this year. It was actually the same guy. They got hot. They got hot. They played that approach. And, and basically what that means is the points per attempt that you get for a three-point shot go up. right? They, they, they literally go up. Statistically speaking, they go up. But when you get cold, does this approach to the game – not become as as valuable or as viable. I don't know, which is quite interesting. Yeah, in, interesting in, in, you're right. In an individual game, that matters. Over the course of the season, I mean, this is a, a statistical premise, right? There will be a regression to the mean. Your your three point shooting in a single game could be uh, above average or below average. Your um, three point shooting over the course of the season is likely to be pretty close to everybody else's. Right? Does that make sense? Like you'll be within mm-hmm. a couple of, of, of standard standard deviations. I mean, this is. I think I've probably made this joke on the podcast before, but I think it's true. It's the reason that tennis is not all that much fun to watch for me, particularly men's tennis, because you know if it's out of seven sets or whatever, the better player is usually going to win. Right? Yeah. And basketball playoff series, seven games, the best team usually wins. It's why I don't like the one game um, playoff uh, play in game into. I don't know if it's play in game is the right word, but the. Uh, you know the wild card the game in in baseball or five game series in baseball. Truthfully, I prefer um, that they're seven game seven game series. Um, like this is in uh, that book Moneyball, where Billy Bean sort of says like a manager in baseball manages for the regular season. You know the mm-hmm. 162 games or whatever. Uh, but once you get to the playoffs, like all of those strategies that you use to get into the playoffs sort of go away because even yes. then a seven game series is a pretty small. Um, you know, sample size compared compared to the, the the length of a regular season. I want to say one other thing about this too. Um, like, sports analytics are important and they're insightful, but um, I think people who might be rubbed the wrong way by them might be see them see them being deployed in an oversimplified way. Does that make sense? Like, mm-hmm. this strategy does not mean that you could just go and find five people who can shoot three pointers 
and put them out there and you're going to win every game because you have to be able to play defense and because um, you have to be able to like there's a there's a lot of people in the in the country who, who are good set shot three pointers but or, or set shooters I mean but you got to be able to move with the ball sometimes you got to be able to make cuts to get the ball you got to be able to, to pass the ball so I want to stress like it's not a simplistic strategy. It's not as easy as saying, well, if everybody just shot way more threes, then you would win. That's, that's, I mean, there's, there's more to it than that. It's a part of the puzzle, but you know, you can't, you can't say it's, it's, it's all that one thing, right? There's defensive metrics as well that, that come into play. And and this is a perfect transition to the next story because the critique of, uh, 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 what the hell's his name? Um, Lorenzo Ball. Lorenzo. Right. Yep. Lon- Lonzo. Lonzo Ball. Is it Lonzo Ball? What the hell's his name? I should know this. Isn't that awful? I'll, Anyhow. You've got three kids that all have names that start with L. That makes it hard. There we go. Lonzo. Lonzo. Lonzo Ball. Lonzo. Okay. So, yeah. Lonzo Ball. Lonzo Ball's the so, kid. LeVar Lonzo Ball is the, the student athlete. At UCLA, uh, in transitioning to this next story, yeah, not anymore. and given one hundred, no, not anymore, one hundred uh, percent commitment to that. The ability to play defense does matter in the NBA, and that has been um, one of the critiques of Lonzo Ball uh, this season is that he does not play defense. Now, people will say, "Oh man, defense! Nobody plays defense in the NBA." That's false. Once you get to the playoffs. Um, Guys play defense, and they they play. You figure out who are the best defenders as well. I mean, I think consider LeBron, right, or Jordan um, when he was playing. Like they go from they don't have to they don't have to play a lot of defense in the regular season because that long game approach that Brian and I just talked about tends to work for teams, and they get a win. They they, they win the most games that get them into the playoffs. But, but come playoffs, right, the sample size is smaller, and it forces. Um, teams to, to take different approaches, including playing defense. And so we get to see how great LeBron is um, in you know a game in a seven game series when he starts to play defense. But anyhow, uh, so Lonzo Ball does not play defense. In fact, I think he gave up 34 to uh, who's the, the the Kentucky player, the Fox that Fox kid from yeah. Kentucky um, Knights, right? Who just lit him up for, uh, 30, 30, for a slew 40, of points. I mean, he scored a lot. 34. Yeah, for sure. So. Uh, Lonzo Ball's in the news not so much because of Lonzo Ball, because but because of his dad. So and ESPN is not really helping that whatsoever. They, I think they, did they give Levar Levar Ball a, a fucking television show. I mean, the guy's <laughs> on there all the time. But what are your he's thoughts on getting back on like today? I think. Oh, I'm sure he will be. He'll have some comments or something. Yeah, he'll have some comments uh, to make about uh, Lonzo going going pro. Which I don't know if anybody caught that, but uh, check that video out. It's like within minutes of UCLA losing, he uh, yeah, it was in the it. it was in the locker room. I don't think he'd taken his yeah. uniform off. Yeah, I'm not I'm not gonna fault the kid. I mean, he's, no. he's just a kid. Uh, but I think that there's a little bit of uh, training, maybe, or conversations that should have been had, not necessarily just by a parent, but maybe by a coach, and it didn't happen. So that could have been that could have been handled with more kid grace. Need twenty pounds. Oh yeah, like he's, he's good, good enough to go to the NBA. Sure, probably. I don't know. I mean, give, yeah, probably. You know, come come out with me in Michigan for a week, man. We'll eat some chips. Some chips. Some, some fried food. Yeah. We'll, heavy beer. We'll get some poutine. Yeah, exactly. Some heavy beer. So what, what's your take on LeVar Ball and just shitty parenting, shitty sports parents? How about that? That was our transition. Yeah. I, I mean, I got sucked into this with the LeBron stuff, right? Like, he, uh, LeVar Ball said something along the lines of, uh, star athletes, kids don't become star athletes because the expectations are are too high. And he gave, you know, he talked about LeBron as an example. You know, LeBron's kids are going to have a tougher road to get to the NBA, which I'll be honest, I heard that. I, I heard, oh, he's talking about LeBron's kids, and I was like, oh, not cool, dude. And then I went and read it, and I was like, actually, he's he's kind of making a broader point, and he just pointed to LeBron's kids as an example. This is a thing where I think, 99% of the time, LeBron's really good at just sort of ignoring stuff that's unimportant, you know, water off your back, that sort of stuff. And and that he responded kind of, you know, I think elevated uh, Ball's status and made it a, a bigger controversy um, than, it, than it kind of was, right? But 
it did shine a light on what was already kind of a burgeoning story about this dude and, and, and prepping his kids for the NBA and the billion dollar shoe contract. And they kind of have their own brand already. And, and is that okay? Right. It drew comparisons with um, Serena and Venus's Williams dad as a sports dad, Tiger Woods dad. Is it okay to kind of force your kids into sports or to make that their primary goal? And I don't, I, 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 I can't point to anything specific, but the dude kind of rubs me the wrong way. Um, at the same time, I kind of I kind of get it, right? <laughs> we, I, I think uh, longtime listeners will know that we make a lot of fun of me for my 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 debate career or whatever. But I you know I always thought it'd be sweet to you know cultivate my kids into into really strong debaters at a young age so they could you know take the debate world by storm, for example. So wow, I, get, I, get, I get I get the mo- I get the motivations, right? I get the idea of of kind of get, getting your kids into something where they can become really, really good and have a chance to make it to the next level, even if that's just college, right? And and Jill, my wife, who we've already mentioned for her uh, success in the in the March Madness bracket, is like she's a, of a different, a totally different mind. She's kind of like try different things, you know, do a bunch of different stuff. If you don't like it, try something new. Like my kids are in a lot of activities and 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 extra like extracurriculars and and sports and. And for her, it's not about, you know, anything else. There's no, there's no utility to it. It's not about getting them to college or pros. It's just like do stuff and have fun. So I don't know. What's your take? I think, I mean, I would, I'd be lying if I said that the guy didn't annoy me, but I think all of those. I'm worried when someone annoys me and I'm not sure why. Exactly. I don't think that my annoyance is. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know um, what? Let, let me say this really quickly, even though I just no. talked for five minutes. You know why he annoys me? Because I think he puts a light on his kids. That I mean, his son's in college basketball. He's going to be a top five draft pick. Um, he he kind of well, you 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 got to deal with that spotlight if you're going to be you're going to be a pro athlete, right? But the his his youngest kid is 15. You know, let the kid let the kid go to school. Maybe that's my problem with it. You know. Well, but I mean. Yeah, it's just it, we don't. I think we are conditioned to probably because of our parents. You, your parents, my parents, and you know, I don't know whether we want to give them credit for that or not. But I think you and I come from the same perspective and how we parent, um, all, due to how our parents raised us, and, and that kind of boisterous, loud, uh, cocky parent is so off-putting, right? So off-putting. Um, whether you're a student athlete playing and you hear that person in the stands or, you know, whether it's the person that, um, you know, is, is there at, co- at practices in high school or all of this stuff. It's just so off putting to us. And I think maybe that is just our perspective. And for other folks, it's not as off putting. I mean, it's not really affecting, uh, LeVar, Ball, LeVar Ball has not really affected Lonzo Ball's play this March, uh, whatsoever. Um, you know what he has affected fact, though, is people's response, right? Lonzo didn't have a very good game yeah. the other night, and Twitter flips out and makes fun of this kid because of his dad. Yeah. Because his yeah. dad comes out and says he's better than Steph Curry, which you're not. You're not. No, you're right. I mean, that, that does hurt him, absolutely. But does he even care about that? Who, the dad? Does the kid, no. the kid, does the kid care? I don't, I don't know. If, if I'm 18, 19, and, and people are saying terrible shit about me on Twitter, I'm offended. But when I was 18, there was no Twitter. Let me ask you this question. If, if ask away. the thing that got Lorenzo Ball in the media in the first place, I mean, like there was the ESPN kind of mini documentary, but the main thing was this, this, this fight with LeBron, right? This, this kind of spat with LeBron. If we take mm-hmm. Lorenzo's argument to be true, that setting high expectations for your kids makes it harder for them to be successful because they won't necessarily meet those expectations, isn't he doing this wrong? Yeah. Isn't he, he's doing the exact thing he's saying you shouldn't do. He's saying my 18 year old's better than Steph Curry, a NBA MVP and NBA champion. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if, if he's he's correct that for LeBron's kid and Jordan's kid and, and superstars kids that the X, that the level of expectation is too high, then, then he should shut up and say the level of expectation isn't that high for my kids because I was a okay college player. But he's making it high when he comes out and publicly says he's he's not writing checks that that his ass can't cash. It's that his kids have to, right? Mm-hmm. And and his his one kid's gonna go in the NBA and and who knows what will happen? Maybe he'll be a, a a bust. Maybe he'll be great. It's hard to say. My pick is that he'll be an average 
point guard, you know, like, I don't think he's going to be Steph Curry, but he's probably not Jimmy, Jimmy Fredette. Um, but, but like, what about this 15 year old? Like that kid could, you know, who knows? I mean, that, that it seems unfair to me. Yeah. And, and, and by his own logic, unfair that, that realistic expectations are a better pathway to success than unrealistic ones. And he's creating super high standards for those kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there seems like uh, there'd be a better way to approach this. But again, neither one of us have had kids with that level of talent. I mean, that's sure to happen someday, considering, you know, our bloodlines. But <laughs> <laughs> as of yet, no. So I did, um, I, I, I did right, not that's... set expectations very high for any of my kids. No, I, I was a D3 <laughs> student athlete for a semester, so. Yeah. Yeah, I was they bad at everything easily, I did. They can easily surpass me. I was bad at everything I did until we found the podcast venue. And I played JV basketball in seventh grade. Ooh, hey. So, again. And you to, stopped growing. To pass, point. to pass the old man ain't that difficult. In seventh grade, that's, that's, well, that's it. You know, props to you. Hey, uh, we have four minutes left before we wrap this up. What are your thoughts on the uh, – rule changes in Major League Baseball. So um, before you ask that question, let me just say that Major League Baseball is eliminating the four-pitch intentional walk, and instead it will just be, um, a, I guess, a manager you saying, just, okay, we're going to walk. Hey, I'm walking you. I'm walking you. Take and you uh, the reason being, I'm looking here at uh, Rob Manfred, who's the MLB commissioner's comments, uh, sees the move as helping speed up games. So oh my I God. think that's probably the main reason why this is being implemented. But hey, 538, um, I, figure out how much time was wasted last year by intentional walks. Because I bet you it was eight total minutes. And I mean, there's some upset the folks season. about this, too. Huh? Um, there's some pissed off people. Uh, pissed Jason off. Kips, Kipnis, yeah, Jason Kipnis uh, tweeted, but I've scored twice on an overthrow during an intentional walk. <laughs> <laughs> he tweeted exactly. this. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, I, you're right. Um, seems like a silly way, uh, a wrongheaded um, solution to a much bigger problem. So there's actually a rule Thoughts. in baseball. It's my favorite kind of piece of baseball trivia. Is there's a rule in baseball that says the only player, the only defensive player who's allowed to be out, outside of the foul lines is the catcher, right? Mm-hmm. So outfielders cannot start in foul territory. They have to be in fair territory. The reason for this is okay. because there was enough overthrows that that players that that teams when there was nobody on base would send the third baseman to stand behind the catcher when they intentionally walked people to catch the ball oh and so oh, baseball created a rule change that said no you got to be able to throw it to the catcher right wow yeah that makes total sense huh yeah okay so that, that's good to know what that's so, uh, okay. you, like yeah good to know. overthrows if you can't if you can't throw four balls on purpose then i mean it, it's not going to speed up the pace of play. It's not. Exactly. Baseball has a time problem. It has a, it has a time issue. This is just, this is a wrongheaded solution to three and a half hour baseball games that are great for people like you and I. Yeah, I was going to say, could it's not a through. No, I mean, I love this stuff, but when you're trying to attract fans uh, that are 20 to 30 years old, um, who not, you know, not only is it a boring game and it's boring for anybody, but we're talking about people who, um, for various cultural and technological reasons, have attention spans that are much different than those who are 50, 60, 70 years old. And that's been proven, right? That's science. So I guess baseball, they got to figure something else out. And I don't know what it is, but I mean, this is nice, right? I guess. But again, how, how give me like in a, in time, right? In seconds, how much... Uh, how much time this is going to save on average in a game. And it can't be more than what, Brian, 15 seconds? If that, It's the fastest thing that happens in baseball. Just real quick, four pitches. You know you know what's coming. It, it yeah. takes no time. It takes no. absolutely no time. No time. How does, how does baseball solve its time problem? Oh, let's just go to five innings. Five inning baseball games. No, I'm I, think I don't know. Up. Again, the, the, you have to accept the premise that there's a, there's a time problem in baseball. And and I don't ex- I don't ex- I don't accept that accept that premise. 
Like here. Oh, okay. Here's, here's the problem. Like, gotcha. Here's the problem. Like, wh- who do you gain and who do you lose with changes like this? You're not going to lose any. I'm not going to stop watching baseball because they make this specific rule change. But this brand of rule change, like, I don't. I hate replay. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. They're 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 trying to slow. Uh, they're trying to you know move that along a little quicker too. That's I I, I don't hate it because of pace of play. I just like to watch managers go out and argue. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And, and, and sometimes it was for, for sort of different reasons, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's like people who say, oh, fighting in hockey, it's so stupid. Why is it there? Well, fighting in hockey isn't just, you know, because you want to beat the other guy up necessarily. Sometimes you go out there and do it to, you know, inject some energy in, into, your, into your side, right? Like, so managers, managers, managers sometimes go out there and, and get riled up. They still get thrown out sometimes. Right, even though there's replay, they do it to kind of say, "Come on, let's go, let's let's get into this game, let's do something, let's have some have some energy." It was, you know, it was all part of the the, the texture of the game that I liked, and it's gone, it's it's just gone away. There needs to be a shot clock like approach to pitching. That's my answer, right? You need to get pitchers just to, to work faster. It's just as simple as that. Because there are some dudes up there that just take forever and ever and ever. Just isn't that isn't that, isn't that strategic? Like, but this is something. No, I mean, yeah, from a, I don't know how. I, age. Yeah, maybe. Like, but you realize, like, to, there have to, been to quick pitch somebody a a, 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 a a batter who's not ready is a strategy. But, to to but, hold the ball for a really long time when somebody's on first base is a strategy. Your defense is more apt to make an error though with the slower pitcher. That's that's a saber uh, metrics um, statistic, because infielders get bored when you're slow. And when you're when you're fast, they're always kind of on their toes, to use that cliche. And they're 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 more prepared to play defense. So I'm not sure which outweighs which, right? Does it like does throwing the pitcher off, or sorry, does yeah. throwing the batter off outweigh the possibility for error in the infield, or does it? Or, maybe, or having the pitcher I don't know. comfortable in 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 their pace of play. Right. I mean, right. I don't think but. any pitchers are doing it to deliberately slow the game down. <laughs> No, I don't either. I, oh, no, no, I agree. Um, okay, well, we shall wrap that up uh, for today. When we record next week, we won't have a new national champion yet, but we'll have at least a championship game, so yeah. we'll get into that. Um, the Raiders might be in uh, hope- Vegas, too. Oh, and when is that decision I think I come down? Today. Oh, okay. Or it's All coming right, so soon. Plenty of things to talk about. But uh, everybody, thank you for listening. Uh, be sure to like us, follow us on Facebook at Sports Nerds. Uh, we're also on Twitter um, at underscore Sports Nerds. We'll be up on uh, YouTube soon. So I'll send that link out across social media and we're going to find a way to add some more web content. We'll keep you posted on all of that. Make sure you like us, rate us on iTunes and Stitcher. That would be much appreciated. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell people at work about us. Uh, we do benefit from word of mouth so thank you for those who've already done that brian good show today thank you my friend good work you have a fantastic monday yes 